Yes, hello, welcome everyone to Austria IT Goes International. Uh, I have a distinctive panel here for you today. And um, I hope you can take away as much as you can. Uh, let me introduce to you, first of all, Angela sitting next to me. And don't worry, I just to go quickly around the horn. Everybody will introduce him or herself afterwards. We have Patty here. We have Mike. We have uh, Gerhard. We have uh, Raphael. We have Vincent. Um, and of course, we have you, and we have a Mrs. Webb. She's out here. Uh, just, um, Ms. Webb, may I ask you first to just tell uh, us the ground rules. How can we interact with uh, the audience out there uh, watching the live stream and uh, with their smartphones? Um, we have two hashtags, uh, eday13, and the second one is s4. And yeah, you can tweet everything concerning this podium um, using these two hashtags, um, especially any questions you have, and yeah, I will look after it. <laughs> Thank you, Stefanie. Thanks a lot. Uh, we jump right in. Angela, uh, you're sitting next to me, so I started with you. Uh, up to 11 uh, digital solutions, and Angela, um, you found a service uh, some time ago that I used a lot, SMSAT. Uh, so it was great on the computer, sending out short messages. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your career, what you did, and also you were in Silicon Valley uh, not so long ago. Tell us how that went. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, so Apti11 is a software company. We focus a lot on web, mobile, and especially uh, text messaging. Uh, as you um, told, uh, um, we our roots are sms.it, that most of you probably know. Um, but we expanded our portfolio um, into now four main products. Um, one of them is called MySMS. That's also uh, the product um, that I took with me to Silicon Valley. Um, it's a, a messaging application that combines instant messaging and also text messaging into uh, one product uh, and um, enables users to also send messages from the computer, tablet, and the smartphone, of course. Mm. How yeah. did you end up in Silicon Valley? How did that go? Uh, I mean, for us, uh, MySMS was always designed to be a, a really international product. Um, so from the very beginning, we saw this huge growth in the US. Uh, also, Germany and France are really good markets for us, but the biggest um, uh, user base was uh, the US from the beginning. And then we discovered that there is this, um, that there is this initiative, Go Silicon Valley, and we thought it's the best way to go to enter the, the US market, to really do a global launch, uh, uh, get feedback, get some contacts to start with. It makes a lot of uh, things easier. How did you prepare for the trip? How did you prepare, prepare for what you want, want to get out of this? Um, yeah, I think we, we did a really good preparation before, and that's also something that I would uh, recommend others to keep in mind. Um, we started almost one year before we went to Silicon Valley. Um, Testing a few uh, PR agencies, uh, started some talks, um, reached out to some people um, who can help us with contacts, all that, and uh, of course, um, also set our individual goals. And Angela, what were the three things that you took home from Silicon Valley? Uh, you mean in, in, in terms, terms of, of successes? Yeah, success and also maybe even uh, kind of a personal growth. Uh, for yourself and for the company, of course, what did you take home? I mean, for me, it was really, you can do everything. Like in Silicon Valley, it's really, you start small, but you can pick really fast. And it was also, um, even if you have your main office here in Austria, um, basically everything is possible. I mean, for us, in the first uh, three weeks, um, we l had our global launch, and which worked out really successfully for us. So we doubled our active user base. We got a lot of publicity from all the major tech blocks, um, which wouldn't have been possible to reach here. 
um, but also we um, um, we discovered really good contacts. Even now, we are uh, in talks with with some contacts, and um, for us, it was a huge success. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Vincent. You have also been with the same program uh, yes. here with uh, um, the best practice Silicon Valley, you know, the, the Go Silicon Valley program. Also, maybe Vincent, uh, you tell us uh, a little bit about uh, your company and what you got out of that. And before we do that, I should also maybe introduce myself. My name is Thomas Seifert. I'm the Purity in Chief with Wiener Zeitung, but I'm just your moderator here. So, Vincent, please. Okay. My company runs several local-based search engines based on semantic technologies. And my newest and uh, hottest product uh, is currently All My News, an individual prioritized newsreader where we can figure out which news stories are really relevant for you and uh, place them on top. And this was also the, the main project why I was uh, in the Silicon Valley. It was a, an amazing experience uh, because you can see the Silicon Valley like a big co-working space. Uh, you meet people there everywhere in the supermarket or in the in the Starbucks coffee shop, wherever, and you can uh, communicate with the, pe with the people, you get feedback, you can exchange your ideas, and uh, the most important thing, they already co uh, also connect you to other peoples that could be relevant for you. I mean, uh, some of us maybe only know the Silicon Valley from, uh, you know, the social network movie, where it's like this cool place to be. Is that the case? I mean, apart from the weather, which is obviously quite good, but uh, is it also in kind of ins an inspiring environment? Um, Definitely. Yeah. And I think it's uh, it's uh, some scenes of the of the movie reminded me to the Silicon Valley and to some uh, houses of startup companies that I went. Maybe they didn't had such. Uh, extreme parties going on there, <laughs> but the lifestyle and all the people wearing jeans and t-shirts is definitely the same. And could you bring some of the spirit back home? Yes, um, for me uh, really interesting was uh, how it uh, has opened my horizon in terms of uh, thinking globally and not locally, in terms of uh, how to say, okay, this is a good product or a business idea or not. Uh, this is something you, you learn uh, out of all these discussions you make there every day. Thanks, you, Vincent. I think we, we later come back again to the Silicon Valley theme, I guess. But now I want to move over to Mike. Uh, and Mike is an interesting example because he is originally from the US. He came to Vienna. And actually, he came, came to Vienna also to develop the business and go out again, right? And, and uh, so maybe, Mike, tell us a little bit about what you're doing and uh, how important it is actually to spread out, go out there. Sure, sure, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so I'm the co-founder of a company called Tupelo.com. We're one of Central Europe's largest local search communities, um, close to four million unique visitors every month. Uh, in, uh, I'll briefly go through my history since you, since you mentioned it. Uh, I came over to Vienna in 2001 after my first startup in the US. Um, took a few years off to kind of revive myself from the first bubble. 2003 started working for a Vienna company called Rockstar Games which closed in 2006 where I met my co-founder Clemens and in 2006 started working on uh, Tupelo.com. Uh, 2009 we received investment from one of the largest Yellow Pages publishers in Europe called European Directories. They, as you might know, are the owners of Herald.at here in, here in Austria. Uh, and I'm responsible primarily for international business and partner development. So it's very important for me that we take part in, in, in programs such as Go International. We were invited to go Silicon Valley as well, which we weren't able at the time to attend, sadly. Um, most recently, uh, I started to work together with Patty next to me, who is the organizer of Web Summit, who'll introduce himself, uh, to organize what's called the Vienna Pub Summit, which is a startup, entrepreneur, angel, VC, investor, casual networking uh, gathering where it's just beers and drinks and, and, and networking, which brings a little bit, I guess, of an international uh, 
if you will, network building event from somewhere like Dublin, uh, and you're in London and New York as well, and, and kind of brings it to Vienna and allows uh, the, the ecosystem to, I guess, grow slightly, slightly more, uh, which is, as we all know, ecosystem is always a very large topic, and you hear Berlin is an upcoming ecosystem, you hear London is an e upcoming ecosystem, naturally San Francisco and New York are ecosystems that have existed for a long, long, long amount of time, and I think you're starting to see Vienna grow as an ecosystem, and initiatives uh, such as the Pioneers Festival and the Vienna Pub Summit are, are initiatives that help Vienna grow in that way. Mm -hmm. And just because you mentioned it, Mike, uh, how does Vienna fare? Uh, I mean, as you said, it's, it's developed really fast. We have the hub, which is more also for social entrepreneurship. We have the sector of FIMF. We have the Pioneers Festival. We have the Start Europe events. Uh, from, you have this inside-outside view, I guess. Uh, how is Vienna developing, you think? Well, I, I think it's hard to compare. I, I tried... It's, it's, it's hard not to compare, but it's also hard to compare. Uh, you know, Silicon Valley, New York, They've had a lot of a long time to develop themselves as a startup ecosystem, and that's that's having entrepreneurs, that's having educated workforce, that's having private capital from the seed level, 10, 20, 50k, all the way up to to, to later stage A round, B round, C rounds, uh, and and you, you you've seen London developing over the last 10 to 15 years quite heavily. Uh, you see a lot of startups from Central Europe, like Vienna, having to move to London to find further capital past the seed and the, and, and the angel phase. Um, Berlin now is, is, is the next hype city. Their ecosystem is, is actually growing quite rapidly thanks to uh, you're seeing a lot of U.S. traditional VCs and angels moving over to, to Berlin. But Vienna is, is I would say, a, if you will, and I'm sorry for saying this, but it's a close second to where Berlin is at insofar as that it's been <laughs> rapidly rapidly accelerating as an ecosystem for uh, uh, for tech startups and I think you're seeing that more in the more recent years as pioneers becomes more successful mm -hmm. the Vienna pub summit becomes more successful you're starting to see a lot of uh, co-working spaces which which are coming up as you mentioned like the hub and law office and uh, and and, and, and sector five. So you're starting to see bits of the ecosystem start to take place, especially on the investment side, Speed Invest, I5 Invest are, are, are two uh, early stage investors, investment groups that are, that are investing back into, uh, into Vienna. But it's not quite there yet, but we're starting to see quite a lot of Eastern European, as, you were, as we were talking about earlier before this, um, uh, countries like Poland and, and, and Serbia and the East Hungary, they're starting to view Vienna as this kind of first step towards uh, international expansion and their first kind of ecosystem that's within their, within their reach. So Vienna, I think, is underway and it's certainly, I feel, could be a number three in, in Europe with London and Berlin, of course, having a little bit of an advance on us. Uh, Paddy, of course, knows the European scene pretty well. Not only that, uh, being from Dublin, being from Ireland, which has also this function, this kind of bridge function between North America, the US, and Europe, with a lot of American investment pouring in, etc. So, Paddy, um, before we talk, also you mentioned that how important it is to go out of your comfort zone, to from an early stage, go out and, and look what's out there. So what, I mean, what can we learn from, from your experience in your organizing one of the big, I mean, a huge web summit uh, where you try to network, bring people together for networking. What are the ingredients for going international, for going out there? Um, well, I, I remember one of the, the first things I did, I, I, I started going out with a girl, and I'll come to your point, five years ago. And after about a month, I was so head over heels in love with her, I thought the first place in Europe I should take her to five years ago was, uh, was to Vienna. Uh, so it's nice, uh, it's, it's, it's nice to come back five years later, and she's my fiance now, so clearly uh, <laughs> Vienna made a, made a positive uh, impact on her. Yeah, I, I think earlier we were talking about how it's important to go out of your comfort zone uh, or conference uh, zone, um, and I think for a lot of my friends, uh, they're involved in, in, in startups in, in Dublin. The easiest thing for them to do is to come to the Web Summit in Dublin, and there's another 4,000 plus people there and hundreds of startups from all over the world. Um, but but, but I, I, I kind of firmly believe and I actively encourage them not to do that. I kind of feel that the easiest thing to do in your own city is to go to events in your own city. Uh, but in doing that, you, you tend to possibly end up just gravitating towards the people you already know because you're like, oh, there's Marcus, uh, I'll go and talk to him. Uh, and the best thing I feel that, you know, if you're, if you're a startup, 
and you've got ambitions that are bigger than just conquering uh, Austria, uh, you just gotta, you gotta go to Berlin, you gotta go to London, you gotta take opportunities like these guys to go to Silicon Valley um, and interact with people that you, that you don't know. Go out of your comfort zone and go to events that uh, take you out of your traditional uh, conference zone. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, so, so, so that's kind of one, that's, that's, th that's certainly one big lesson um, that, that, th that I've uh, learned in doing the Web Summit. So I kind of fell into organizing an event uh, about three years ago uh, in, in, in Dublin. Uh, and over the last three years, we've brought um, speakers from all over the world, from many of the biggest kind of tech companies, the founders of Twitter and YouTube and Skype and Foursquare and Tumblr and Facebook and everything in between. Uh, to come and speak and, uh, and last year about 250 of those speakers flew in from, from around the world to come to Dublin and a lot of Austrian startups came to Dublin uh, as well. Uh, and the, you know, out of the startups that were exhibiting of which there were 260, only a tiny fraction of them uh, were Irish. Uh, and I it might sound counterintuitive but I actually think that's a good thing um, because those Irish startups should be spending their time in Vienna at a at a similar event or in Berlin or in uh, Silicon Valley, but so that's my kind of that's my central takeaway from being involved in events for the last three years Don't go to the one next door That's too easy and you'll just meet the guys that are already your friends and you'll hang around and have a beer uh, In the evenings and that's the easiest thing to do and you've missed all the opportunities in my view So yeah, Paddy, thanks a lot for this intermission uh, because the title of this panel is Austrian IT goes international. So thanks for that uh, that was a pleasure year for going international. And actually, um, one the person that I introduced to you now, Gerald, he did that. He went international. He went to this magical place called Berlin. That uh, we are, of course want to hear whether it's really that cool and if it's the place to be. So maybe Gerald, talk a little bit about, uh, of course, also your career, why you went to Berlin, and is it this magical place? Yeah. So hi, I'm uh, the co-founder of Archify, which. Uh, does some kind of uh, private personal search engine. Um, we started the company around two and a half years ago uh, out of Vienna. And um, we realized very soon that uh, Vienna is not the place for us to stay. Uh, the, the, the first reason was uh, well, we are funding issues. So if you want to get a good valuation for your company, which means uh, someone thinks your company is uh, uh, is uh, worth a, a high amount of money. You shouldn't do that in Austria because you get uh, very low valuations because the investment scene is not that big and it's kind of monopolized. But um, it's, it's easier to, ra to raise money in other cities. So uh, first we went to Copenhagen and did an accelerator progr program there at uh, Startup Bootcamp. And afterwards we received funding from uh, VC from London, from Bolton Capital. and. Uh, so every VC uh, we met, every venture capitalist we met, we met. Uh, one of the first questions was, so where do you want to go? So no one did expect that we will stay in Vienna. Everyone, ex everyone expected us, so do you want to go to the States? Do you want to go to London or to Berlin? Uh, no one expected that. So uh, it's also a question of the market. So our product uh, was always an international product. So we need to scale it and that's only possible international. It doesn't make sense to do it only for the, for the Austrian market. So finally we ended up in Berlin uh, mainly because of uh, the prices there. So if you, if you decide to move to London, you will probably end up in a flat which is two hours uh, uh, out of London and you will travel every day two hours to an office which is not on the ground level, it's uh, one level below. So, uh, and, and in, in Berlin it's the other way around, so we live, you will, you, uh, you, it's easy to afford to live in, in the center of the city and it's easy to afford office space there, so that's, that was the main reason. Um, regarding the hype around Berlin, I think yes, it's a hype, but it doesn't mean that uh, you shouldn't ride it because every hype is uh, in a city is also part of the hype you need to uh, generate uh, around your startup. And uh, finally, it comes, it all comes down to generating users and generating traction. So every piece of hype can help your startup. Thanks a lot. Last but not least, uh, on the panel here, Raphael. Um, you are one of the persons here, actually, from 
this very, working in this very building that we are in, who actually made it happen that our two friends here went to Silicon Valley, right? So tell us a little bit about, first of all, how you see the, the scene and also what Austrian IT companies, what they should do in your opinion. And also what, uh, I mean, these programs that we heard a little bit about, what are they about? How can, you know, people here in the audience or, you know, watching this on the internet, how can they profit from these programs? Yes, yeah, thank you, Thomas. Um, uh, I'm Raphael from the International Department of the Federal Economic Chamber. Our job is to support Austrian companies on their way abroad. And I'm very happy, I was very happy to hear about the success stories that uh, in one or another way, is it Silicon Valley, is it Ireland, is it Berlin, uh, that it always pays off to go outside and to open up the market and, uh, and the horizon. And uh, what you said, Thomas, um, what we try to do is not only on IT sector, just to give you a brief view, we are also run, uh, we are a technology industrial resource office of high tech institutions worldwide of the MIT, con of the MIT Massachusetts Institutes of Technologies, which we are having a conference uh, end of May. Um, we are industrial resource office of the CERN of the uh, Fusion for Energy project ITER um, for the ESA European Space Agency and uh, for the ESO, European, uh, European Southern Observatory in Chile, where they now built the biggest uh, telescope of the world to look out for additional human life worldwide. And w one um, out of this uh, initiative, very important initiative, we run the Silicon Valley Initiative and we are very happy uh, to announce uh, about uh, 50 companies already participated in this initiative since 2010. And out of these 50 companies, 46 companies like you found business partners. Nine of these companies, they founded a branch in the US and even three companies got funding in the US and three additional uh, companies got funding in Austria via the Silicon Valley because they got such an image, positive image uh, and perception in the scene that they got funding. So um, a very positive story and we are very happy about to, to continue with this program. And uh, I can now make you uh, one offer, one special offer. Next week there's the jury coming for the next uh, selection process of the Silicon Valley. So if you, we closed the uh, registration already, but we saved four pitching slots for next week for you. So if you are thinking, yeah, you want to try, is your business idea ready for Silicon Valley? Give it a try, contact me, we have information over there. And yeah, we would uh, be very happy to welcome you to the Silicon Valley and, and, and take the chance. Um, and Angela, I mean, how important uh, was it for you? Is it for you to uh, reach out? I mean, what, what, is, what was your uh, intention? Was it to get access to talent, to get access to markets, uh, uh, get access to money, as we heard, which is also sometimes uh, an issue? Uh, for you, for your company, what was uh, the, the major point to, you know, what you got out of it? For us, it was mainly um, to really get into the market mm -hmm. uh, and get to the right contacts. Uh, we tried to get um, a lot of publicity for our product, um, which turned out really good for us. Um, we had um, very at the beginning, we had our global launch, but then also we focused more on partnership. Um, and um, I would say the contacts that we got through the initiative, through the plug and play center there in Silicon Valley, really helped us getting started mm -hmm. there. And um, soon after the program ended, we, had, um, we started our partnership with Evernote, which um, I think wouldn't have been possible if we stayed just here in Austria mm. um, because you don't have the contacts there. There you just go for a coffee with uh, one of the main people there and uh, it just happens, yeah. And Vincent, also may I ask you, 
uh, you just mentioned it's called a plug and play center. That also sounds pretty cool. Um, how can I just envision this thing? I mean, if I have no clue how it looks like, what it's like, just give us a few words on what this thing is and what, how it works, so to speak. So when you went there, what did you actually do? Or how did I mean, the plug and play center is uh, a big office center with a lot of uh, startup companies there. Um, you get, uh, you, you have some kind of uh, starting week, some kind of plug and, it's called plug and play university, where they introduce you uh, to the basics of the Silicon Valley, how the funding works, uh, how about the legal system when you start your company there, and all this stuff. Uh, but, uh, and they also, it's some kind of um, um, business accelerator program there. If they are in interested in your uh, company, then they also invest. But uh, after some weeks of, uh, or the first week maybe, <laughs> it's, uh, you have to go out to the Silicon Valley because there are, there are events everywhere. There are the big companies everywhere. Just uh, you just drive uh, some blocks, and you are at the Google headquarter or at Apple, Apple Facebook, whatever. I mean, you, you just dropped in there more or less, and, and yes, yes. For me, people. I can just underwrite what what he said. For me, it was also a very spontaneous thing. I think uh, I heard about the initiative uh, in February or something like that, and in the end of March, I was already there. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I'm very happy that I did it because there's always uh, the question when is the right time to go to the Silicon Valley or somewhere else and I think mostly you think there is never the right time yeah, because you always think uh, maybe their product is not in the right phase or whatever but uh, I can just say just, just do it. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, Paddy, um, What's interesting about this industry, I think, and what a lot of people, why a lot of people are drawn to this industry, because unlike other industries, here it's a lot about win-win. It's a lot about when you have find partners, when you find other people to work with. Uh, usually, or very often, you look for win-win situation for both sides. It's not this cutthroat competition that you have in other industries. Sometimes it is, but very often it's not. So from your experience, what kind of uh, tips would you give, uh, you know, people like Vincent, like Angela, people in the audience, uh, how to find these win-win situations, how to find potential partners, how to you know, network in a way that you can find the people that you can do business with. Um, well, I think Angela obviously has already found somebody in Evernote, so that's... Uh, <laughs> that's a, yeah, she I have it on, she, on, the, on my iPad, of she course. Does, she doesn't need any help. <laughs> um, so, um, in, 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 in terms of how I've just seen kind of other uh, companies uh, operate, I think it's... Uh, you know, oftentimes people think that uh, they need to go to the CEO of, uh, of Evernote to get a partnership, but I, th I think that's a mistake, usually, uh, because there are lots of other people within uh, a company uh, like Evernote that have the authority to make decisions on partnerships or integrations uh, with, your, uh, with your products. So I think sometimes the biggest challenge is just finding who the relevant person is uh, to meet uh, in Evernote. Uh, or in Foursquare or in Facebook um, and you know the likelihood that Mark Zuckerberg is going to reply to your email about a partnership is zero. Um, <laughs> so you've got to find the next most relevant person and sometimes I think uh, the best starting point can actually be uh, in, uh, in your home territory. So it could be Europe's uh, HQ. So with, uh, in, in the case of Facebook, I think a perfect example uh, is just that their EMEA headquarters are in Dublin uh, and it happens you know, the, the guys that are there are quite accessible because the amount of kind of uh, inbound requests they're getting on a daily basis is, uh, is quite low. And there are lots of international tech companies that startups are looking to partner with all the time and they have uh, headquarters in Berlin or in London or in Stockholm or in Dublin or probably in Vienna. Uh, and I think it's sometimes better to go in the back door than to go in the uh, front door and demand that Mark Zuckerberg meets with you for an hour uh, to, to partner. So try the back door before you try the front door. But, but you did have uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, on a pub tour at the Dublin summit, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, 
So, so you can just attend the Dublin Web Summit and meet Mark Zuckerberg and yeah, then could. try to get his attention there. Yeah, so he, sh he just ha he happened to be in Dublin. He turned up at a, at a, uh, at a pub summit, um, which the press kind of covered because some people posted pictures. Um, but we could neither confirm nor deny that he was... Uh, so did you uh, buy him a Guinness <laughs> or how, how did you approach him? Well, the, the, the Guinness, thankfully, was, was, was free. I, you know, <laughs> at, uh, you know, not that he's price sensitive about spending uh, three or four dollars. Um, so, um, yeah, I, th I, th I think also events are great. You just got to pick, uh, you pick your events. Find vertical specific uh, events and go and find, uh, find those people. I think it's you know, one of the easiest ways for us so we will have, we haven't announced any of the names, but we'll have somebody uh, quite significant from Evernote and things like Foursquare in Dublin uh, in October. And oftentimes you just follow those guys on Twitter. Um, if you do want to meet them or you want to meet the guys in charge of partnerships, you just follow them on Twitter and you can find out where they are. So if you happen to be in New York or Silicon Valley, you can just show up at the restaurant that they've just checked in if you're that desperate to try and get a partnership with them, or you can just show up at an event that they happen to be tweeting from. I, I just think Twitter is marvelous from that point of view uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of tracking people, uh, tracking people down. So uh, yeah, go, go to events, not my events, lots of other events out there. Yeah, we have questions. Yeah, obviously, this is work, yeah. Obviously, initiatives like the Go Silicon Valley program are great chances for Austrian startups to get international contacts, uh, find new cooperation partners. Yet, as we see with cases like uh, Archify, once an IT startup reaches a certain point and wants to get venture capital, Vienna still isn't much of an option. So a question, first of all, to Gerald Beck, what would make you move back to Austria? What would have to change? And then also to uh, Raphael from VKO. What can VKO do to uh, basically avoid that kind of brain drain? Very good question, Gerald. So I think for us it's too late. So uh, uh, <laughs> I, I, I cannot see a point where we move back to Austria because yeah, uh, we, need, we would need to move the whole team to Austria and the only Austrians in, in our team are Max and me, the, the two co-founders. But, uh, but the rest of the team is, is very international and likes to stay in Berlin, so we, need to, we would need to find a new team. That's not really possible. But uh, yeah, what, what would make us, uh, what would have made us stay in Austria? Uh, I, I'm, uh, honestly, I, I'm not really sure about that, but uh, what, one major point is that uh, there needs to be a, a bigger in investment scene which, which means that there, is, there, there, there needs to be more competition between uh, business angels and we, we, need more, uh, we need more early stage funds. We also need uh, venture capitalists and uh, we, we don't have that right now compared to other cities. So uh, Copenhagen, S Stockholm, they, they all have uh, one or two really big VCs, which means they have a, a, a they are managing a portfolio with at least 100 million euros. And I think the biggest uh, startup fund in, in Vienna manages now 12 million euros or so. So, uh, so that's really good that they are existing, but we need more of them and we need competition between them so uh, that we have higher valuation and can attract uh, companies to stay there. But uh, you will always have the problem of uh, getting to your market and uh, so uh, you will always, uh, there are many IT startups will have the need to open offices somewhere else too, at least. But uh, currently it's better to move uh, to Berlin or to London. Okay. Um, thank you for the question. This is a very important question and, and Gerrit also made one point out of it. Our goal is not uh, that the companies move out, but that the companies found branches, they open up the markets, um, find new markets, find new uh, partners. And so far, uh, the main part of the Silicon Valley participants stayed with the headquarters in Austria. Why? Because still in Austria, you have a certain uh, pool of talent, you have a, a good education system. And, but of course, we cannot avoid this. Yeah? This, this, uh, this is clear. But we made the experience that uh, the step 
going out, also taking the risk from our side that the company permanently moves. Uh, we take this in account, this risk, and until now, we are very lucky that uh, the Silicon Valley company is speaking, or uh, stayed with headquarters in Austria and just founded uh, uh, branches abroad. If I can add one thing. Sure. Um, it's what people always told me when, when we were at Silicon Valley. They said, bring your salespeople for sure, bring your marketing, but leave your uh, technical staff at home. Yeah, You won't get this knowledge, this quality of people in Silicon Valley due to the high competition. Because if there is a great programmer, he will probably go to Google, Facebook, or all the big ones. If you're a small startup, you won't get the great talent. So better leave your talent here, go with your sales, business development, you can go to the Silicon Valley. So, so at, the, at the risk of being uh, undiplomatic, I just don't believe that, that you need to move from Vienna to, 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 to raise money. I think there are incredible examples all over Europe of, of, of startups that have grown and raised incredible amounts of money and they're in, they're in tier two or tier three cities. You can look at, you can go to Helsinki uh, in Finland and I can count like this many companies like Supercell uh, or Rovio and more uh, that have bucked the trend. There are examples of that in Ireland, you know, from, you could take Ron Conway in Silicon Valley, he hasn't been to Ireland in 15 years and he's put money into lots of companies uh, in, uh, uh, in Dublin. You can look at the United States and you'll find companies like Dyne in New Hampshire or Qualtrics in Utah and they have grown despite not being in these centers and I think I would avoid, I, it, from a talent point of view, I would avoid uh, hyped up cities like Berlin uh, or London or San Francisco or New York because I think it's really hard to hire talent in a world where it is already really hard to hire technical talent. Fine, I think there's a good argument for sales and marketing. If you're doing an enterprise sale, yeah. it's great to have mm. people in these big cities or if it's a very specific vertical uh, that you want people in uh, certain markets, fine. But there are so many companies that have grown so successfully and raised money despite them being located in a, in, a, in a tier two city. The final example I'll just give is an Irish company which sold for 150 million uh, to uh, Getty Images a number of years ago. It, it was started and stayed in a 5,000 person village on the southwest coast uh, of Ireland. And that founder is building another company and he's refusing to move. And that's not the only tech company in that tiny village in the southwest of Ireland surrounded by sheep and mountains. Um, <laughs> so you can build a company um, from literally anywhere and Balderton have invested in one of those companies. I don't believe you need to uh, relocate out of Vienna. That's just my feeling. And I think that's a perfect example of what I wanted to take on. Ecosystems are always a very complex uh, issue. You, of course, need uh, access to government funding uh, from an early stage to a later stage. Uh, you need access to private funding. Uh, you need access to talent pool, which also brings in the education system and, 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 and interaction with uh, the universities, who also are, are open to interacting with uh, early stage te tech startups. So the, the talent pool can grow as well. I think on, on, on the topic of private equity, private investment, uh, I think Vienna, as I said, it, it, it's underway and there's a few more cycles I think Vienna needs to go through of uh, uh, startups like, like, like Artify or, or, or even like Tupelo, Tupelo uh, achieving some success. Uh, maybe that's not necessarily in Vienna, but they're still keeping the base in Vienna. Uh, but achieving that success, whether it's in Berlin or it's in the Silicon Valley, uh, and then some of them coming back and then reinvesting their time, reinvesting their knowledge, reinvesting their capital back into the ecosystem. And you saw that with Marcus Wagner. He's a perfect example. He was an early angel investor in Tupelo. Uh, he, he exited his company, uh, I don't remember, in a range of $50 million, went to uh, New York, came back a year later, started I-5 Invest, and started reinvesting in that uh, in that community. Then you had uh, uh, Jumio, Daniel, and Roman. Um, they started in Linz, uh, uh, of all places, uh, which is a great city, but you wouldn't think of it as a, as a, as a, as a startup hub. Uh, 
moved out. Jaja uh, uh, -Ja went, uh, I think, raised uh, uh, capital in, in San Francisco. And now uh, uh, Daniel is back at least in Linz uh, with his payment startup, Jumio. And he's also reinvesting in, on an angel level back into uh, Vienna and Linz-based startups. So I think as you see more of that activity and more uh, startups achieving that success and the founders coming back and reinvesting in the community, the ecosystem will start to grow. And then they'll have more of in, uh, influence with the government funds, with education. And that's how an ecosystem starts to build itself. And I think that's something, especially since 2006, I've seen occurring quite, quite heavily in, uh, in Vienna, if you will. It's been two cycles, I would feel, and since 2006. I think we have one or two more to go before it really starts to reach the level of where you can say, oh, I'm going to Vienna and starting my, founder, my, my startup instead of, oh, I'm going to Berlin. Yeah. Yeah, so of course there are always uh, companies who can, who, who can make it out of everywhere. But the question is, what, what's, what's the best place to be? So, and I honestly doubt that the, the best place to be is, is, is a city with only a few hundred uh, inhabitants. But, uh, but of course, you can make it also from there, but it's, it's tougher there. Um, and so, and hiring talent, it's, it's tough everywhere. So, uh, we had the same problems acquiring high tech engineers in Vienna as we have in Berlin right now because. So, because most of the most of the high tech people in, in Germany, they want to work for Siemens or, or other big companies, but they are not considering working for a small startup. And if they are considering to work for a startup, they want to work for the sexy startups like uh, SoundCloud or Amen or, or, or someone like that. But uh, so it's it's really it's really hard to to convince them to, to work for us. But uh, it's easier if you're in Berlin not to acquire the people from Berlin, but to get uh, talent from all over Europe and make them move to Berlin. And it's way easier to, to convince them to move to Berlin uh, than convincing them to move to Vienna. Vienna is a nice, uh, is a nice city to live, but um, not everyone in Europe knows that. And uh, they, 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 so they are easier to convince to, to uh, move to Berlin. And that's why it's easier to get uh, the talent for Archify there. Uh, you need to help me out now. Uh, there, I think there was a question here. Uh, you have the microphone, OK? Yeah. OK, I have a question. We talked about what Vienna can do and what you get out of that for what Vienna can do, what the Wirtschaftskammer can do. I just wonder. Uh, what happened to yourself going to uh, Silicon Valley? Did you manage to find out some new ways to think, new ways to act, to receive things, how to... Uh, actually, the whole thing. Uh, uh, did you uh, find out a change in yourself? I definitely did, yeah. <laughs> All the all what? the points you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Because what specially? Um, what specially? It's uh, as I already mentioned. It broadened my horizon. Yeah. To think more 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 globally, not so locally. Um, to to get all this feedback. Yeah. And um, yeah. Yeah, I think it really broadens your perspective. Uh, you also find out, normally you think, okay, I have a really cool product, I bring this to the market, and a lot of people think, yeah, I'm the only one with this idea. If you go to another market, you recognize if you're in several talks with other people, and they say, oh, yeah, that's, that sounds like this one, or, oh, yeah, that's like that one. And say, no, but I'm, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it differently, yeah. But they say, so you realize, okay, there are a lot of ideas out there that are similar and you really need focus and you really need to find out how can you differentiate against all these other products that are trying to do the same thing or uh, solving a problem in a similar way. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Thomas. I'm part of the Pioneers Festival organization team and I have a question for Patty. Um, I deeply uh, have a great respect for what you're doing for the startup community in Europe and connecting also Europe and the US. Um, uh, and I think that our common goal is to uh, foster and, and bring the startup community to the next level. Um, so my question is, why did you put the Dome Web Summit to the exact same date as the Pioneers Festival? 
isn't that isn't that uh, a bad thing for all startups in in Europe? Sure. I mean, I d I don't think it's ideal, but when you have First of all, a tradition of always holding it on, uh, on that weekend over the last three years, and you have 7,000 people coming to a city with 12,000 hotel rooms. There are certain limitations in terms of the dates that you can go to, uh, and it turns out that the date on the calendar historically for us in 2010 and 2011 that we should go for is uh, the last week in, uh, in October. Um, so, yeah. Are you, are you, are you con you're concerned? I'm, I'm not concerned. It's just a question. It's really a question, it's a missed opportunity. Sorry. Thank you. It's a missed opportunity for, for a startup in Eastern Europe, for example, to have, uh, to decide between one of the two great events in, in Europe. Uh, wouldn't it be easier to, to make it on, on different dates and, and, and get, get those startups to both events and to bring them the most uh, feedback and best feedback they can get it? I I, I, I can't but agree with you. I, I, it sounds like a trick question. Uh, I mean, how could anybody say... How, why, of course, the answer to your question is your question. Okay, so... If that makes sense. Uh, it's like, I, I suggest very obvious. that the two of you uh, yeah, yeah. go for the, the pub crawl uh, tonight and hash it out over a Guinness or two. I think, I think a perfect... Because that's definitely be a point, you know, for... Uh, you know, coordinating these these uh, meetings. Um, as as Thomas was just mentioning, uh, and a perfect topic with the Web Summit uh, tonight. Patty and I are organizing the Vienna Pub Summit, which is going to be around 150 to 200 people uh, with free beer tonight from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, in the office on Schottenfeldgasse. Everybody in the room is invited. If you look at the hashtag, I believe Emily from the Web Summit, who's in the room has also linked out uh, the address and information. Everybody's welcome to come and ask Patty more questions that are difficult to, if not awkward, to, <laughs> to answer on stage. Well, I, I really like that because there's a, there's a tangible takeaway from this panel, which is free beer at night. I mean, how, how good is that? Uh, can can, it, can it get argue better? with free beer. Uh, yeah, nobody can argue with that. But also, Ms. Webb, Stephanie, had uh, an intervention or a question from our Twitter friends. Uh, you need the microphone. There it is. Um, we have a question to Patty as well concerning the Web Summit. And it's what are the three main benefits a non Irish startup will obtain by attending? Sure, I think, that, I think that's a very good question. So um, I think there are a number of benefits. Depends on, depends on what you're doing. So we had about 200 investors from pretty much every major VC and minor VC from all over the world. So if you're looking for investment, whether it's from Kleiner Perkins or Sequoia or Andreessen Horowitz or Excel or Index or anybody in between, it's a good opportunity. You also have the editors or columnists or journalists from pretty much all of the world's major publications, both traditional and tech. Um, so that's, if you want hype, then you can get a little bit of hype. Um, and then the, the, the third reason is the fundamentally most important reason to come to Dublin when it's cold and wet at the end of October, and that's to get drunk. Um, <laughs> so um, so the, 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 the nighttime activities are very, very social. Um, we take over lots of different pubs in a particular area of the city, and then depending on whether you're a developer or you're a slightly more kind of corporate development guy, uh, or you're a social media guy, or you're an engineer, there's different pubs that you can go to to meet your own kind, or if you're fed up of your own kind, you can take the suit off for a day and put on a T-shirt and go meet the cool kids. So, uh, and also, uh, um, Patty, if I if I may, because before uh, uh, I sh we we talked a little bit about also what are good places, good spots in Europe for startup companies, and you mentioned Eurostat numbers where you have high talented people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, a macro question from my uh, from my uh, point here. I mean, we're talking all about the Euro crisis and uh, Europe being in deep funk. And we all know that it's only going to work with growth, right? Mm. And here in this room and on the podium, there are people are sitting with innovative products that can generate growth. So when you look at these figures from Eurostat, um, where do you see uh, countries uh, that have the talent, that have people working in tech, uh, have high R&D investment uh, quotas? 
where, where do you think this growth will come from in Europe? I mean, your, Ireland is a good point. I mean, obviously building houses is not the way to go forward. I mean, uh, we have to have other industries, right? Mm. So I'll share the statistics on a link uh, afterwards, but the kind of countries in Europe with the highest number of students in universities studying the core computer science, maths, uh, and engineering, uh, Germany uh, is, is number one. Uh, Ireland is number two, uh, and I actually think Austria is number three. The guys towards the very bottom are Portugal, Spain, and Romania. Um, so I think there's, there's a core number of countries that are very well positioned. Um, there's obviously then some countries, so these are two separate Eurostat reports, where the percentage of the workforce working in high tech already is particularly high in a number of countries, and particularly low in a number of countries. So Spain is completely rock bottom in Europe. Fewer people work in high tech than any other country in Europe than, than Spain. So Spain is at the bottom. And then towards the very top, you've got the Scandinavian countries, which includes Denmark, but also Switzerland uh, and Ireland. And then clustered in between is uh, Austria, Germany, the United Kingdom, uh, and a few other countries. So I think, I think Austria is very well positioned. I think Germany is well positioned. I think Spain is possibly fucked. Um, we should probably... Beep. Um, and, uh, and maybe, hopefully, Ireland is well positioned. But I think you've got to be very, very careful. Ireland put a lot of its eggs in one basket, which was building houses. Uh, and so I think Vienna and the government obviously have to be very careful. You can't just dedicate all your resources to high tech, because I'm sure we'll go through another cycle. Uh, so the last thing you want to do is pin all your hopes on, uh, on tech. But just also one more question to my panel, and maybe even to the audience. Uh, my impression is still that what happened in the last five, six, seven years is that entrepreneurship got cool with young people. I mean, it, 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 there is this certain movement, especially with young people coming out of universities, uh, you know, to go and do their own thing. And I think that's a, that's a good thing. I'm, I'm not sure. Is it just me? Am I naive? Am I dreaming? Or is it really happening? I mean, it's, it's certainly happening, and you see it becoming more of a, from a from uh, geeks in a, in, a, in a garage creating uh, something weird that won't ma make it uh, cool to the market for another 10 or 20 years to people coming out of university and saying, okay, I want to be an entrepreneur, I want to have my own company, I want to form my own startup. In the US, that was the first thing I learned when I started going to school is that in order to be successful, you need to think your own way and start your own company and do your own business. Uh, I think Europe is, is following quite rapidly uh, in that, but there's a good saying in, uh, and, and this is where it kind of comes to a, to a downside, great saying in Texas where it's, uh, they say all hat, no cattle, uh, and it's very, uh, it's very important that there's actually some substance behind that. So it's great to have ideas and it's great to have uh, dreams and visions, but also need to remember that it's a business that you're starting with a lot of responsibility and you're responsible not only for your employees, but you're responsible to your shareholders. So there's a lot of work involved in that that doesn't necessarily always get taught in the universities, but hopefully that's also, also coming. I just want to mention one more thing. Yeah? All these ecosystems, they are really great and it's really important to go international. But after all, if you get uh, fed up with beer and pizza, it's great to come back to Austria and enjoy this great country and the lifestyle and the culture as I did. I was very happy to get back again too. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I can see that. <laughs> yeah, and um, I just wanted... Beer is really awful in the US, I agree, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> And I want to make uh, an addition, if you want to taste the uh, Irish beer too, we also promote uh, business, of course, in Ireland being uh, the headquarters, Europe headquarters for Google and Facebook and have nine out of ten significant branches of the uh, big ICTs. We also plan a fact-finding missions there. Uh, we have the information over there. We are very welcome. To, to join us on this fact-finding mission uh, in the second half of this year. Um, if there are no more uh, further questions, are there? Nope. Which is good because anyway, we are also again a little bit uh, over time here. But I want to thank uh, my podium guests here. Thank you very much. I wish you all success. Thank you. And hopefully see you in the evening for the, uh, at the pub. Uh, and also thanks a lot to the audience. Um, Stefanie, do we have a more intervention? No, okay. So uh, I'll close that session. Thanks everyone. And please go ahead and, and grab the opportunity to grab all these people. If you have any questions for bilateral talks, just uh, grab them. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thanks a lot.